Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 219 of Stand Up. Joining me today, one of your all-time favorite guests, the legal eagle, constitutional law scholar, Professor Eric Siegel. I'm Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Yes, I think that next week, a week from today... We are going to have a major win. And I know that people get worried when we make such predictions because you really think that it might bring too much comfort and maybe people will get relaxed and not vote. You have to vote. You have to be a part of the win. You can't sit on the bench. You have to do everything you can in the next week to motivate the people in your life that you know and people that you don't know to vote. And that's what I am going to do and I'm dedicated to doing every single day between now and then and pretty much what I've been trying to do for the past year here on this podcast. Trying to boost as many voices as I can who are reasonable, thoughtful, decent, educated experts And call them up and have conversations with them and maintain my own sanity and help you maintain yours. That is what I have been doing for the past year with this podcast. And I'm feeling good. Yes, I am. Sorry. Because all signs are pointing to a massive win for Joe Biden and Democrats or not to be partisan or divisive. People who are sane, who are still living in reality, and who are decent people who just can't take one more day of the chaos. We are a week from Election Day. 69.5 million Americans have already voted. NBC News has officially moved the state of Texas from lean Republican to toss-up. Not likely Republican, not lean Republican, but toss-up. Texas. Beto O'Rourke says Texas is Joe Biden's to lose. And believing that Biden has a shot to win Texas is part of what is going to help get me through the next week. Well, that cannabis products and you guys, you guys are helping me every day. Get through the day knowing that I'm talking to guests who you are caring about hearing from. I'm posting it each and every day as a podcast and soon more and more video. However, Texas's Supreme Court apparently is upholding their awful governor Abbott's order limiting counties to one drop off site for absentee ballots, dealing a blow to Democrats and voting rights groups. Isn't that weird that there are there has to be voting rights groups and that it's a Democratic thing to Argue for voting rights. These are the groups that had won a temporary injunction blocking this mandate of limiting counties to one drop off site. Why would you do that? Why would you make it harder for people to vote? They're allowed to pull this shit off because it makes it harder for people to vote because the Supreme Court decision that decided that racism was over and states that eh, they, they wouldn't be dicks anymore. And as soon as the decision was reversed, states that were dicks went back to being dicks again. And being dick is an understatement. Because they follow this playbook that includes rewriting districts. So you're guaranteed to get and keep a Republican. Democrats have done that as well, but not nearly as pervasively or as effectively as Republicans did from the last Senate onward. And they just ended this Senate, Senate census, rather, I meant census, ab- uh, abruptly early. But this playbook involves gerrymandering and involves voter suppression and every other dirty trick that the Roger Stones and Paul Manaforts and other scumbags could get away with. It's not going to work. They're still going to lose. They'll suppress and hide votes. They'll accuse Democrats of doing the same thing, or they'll accuse Democrats of somehow allowing or organizing undocumented illegal Americans, as they call them, from voting or for voting for them. They, I mean, this is the, the idea that they they said, uh, and Trump said this over and over, one of the most egregious, offensive, and damaging lies that three million 
non-Americans voted in the presidential election. They didn't. There's no evidence of it. He created a investigation for to find that. They couldn't find it. That investigative body fell apart. Look it up. They found nothing because it doesn't make any sense to commit that crime. It makes sense to shoplift a pair of socks or food if you need socks and you're hungry. It makes sense to pull off a heist that as a potential reward is a lot of money, some major windfall. It doesn't make sense to commit a crime that's a major crime, which is voting illegally, because that will not have an effect in the outcome of the election, and the consequences are too great. It doesn't make sense. And if it was organized, you'd be able to find it out. You can't do it. You can't do it, even though Republicans in North Carolina most recently tried something like that, and they got caught for it. They're the only ones guilty of this kind of hijinks that has people voting that should not be. But it's not going to be enough. They're, they're going to lose because there are too many people who still live in reality, who are decent, who can't bear to watch this country fall off the cliff of a fragile democracy into uh, modern-day American autocracy. There are too many of us. I hope. So in the time between now and Election Day, I want you to feel good. Give yourself permission to feel good. Or don't. There is a spectrum of people, and my wife is on one side of it, that are, I think, often more realists in some ways, and also more in a mode to protect themselves from future damage by not allowing themselves to feel this optimism that I'm allowing myself to feel. And that is a completely normal spectrum, and we're all on different parts of it. Some of you don't want to let yourself believe it because you can't bear the idea of being broken and living with this for another period of time. And then there are some of us like me who are very optimistic, who see the glasses half full. When I see the cloud as a graphic and the weather cloud and the sun, I think, well, that's going to be a sunny day, not a cloudy day. Does that make any sense? That's how I see it. I see things generally working out, including for myself, but you got to work at it. They don't just happen. Right. And we have worked so hard in so many different ways to hold on to what we have, make up for what we've lost and make gains where we desperately need to on issues from sexism to racism to the future of the health of the planet, sustainability and environmental solutions, which is what I hope to get back to talking about, you know, those old existential threats. There's going to be no shortage of drama, and the lame duck period is going to be terrifying. I talk about that with Eric Siegel today. But allow yourself, I say, and you can beat me up if I'm wrong, allow yourself in the next week to feel good, to feel okay, to look forward to turning the page on this monster. I'm going to, you don't have to. But I'm, I'm giving you permission to for whatever it's worth. Who am I to give anybody permission to feel anyway? But I'm allowing myself. So anybody that wants to join me, welcome to the party. All right, let me just talk briefly about the latest on COVID. The White House Science Office listed ending the COVID-19 pandemic as the top accomplishment of President Trump's first term. They're saying that he ended the COVID-19 pandemic, even as... Our country is setting new records for new daily infections and numerous hospitals across the country are stretched to their breaking limits. And in the White House Science Office, they're saying that as one of his accomplishments, top accomplishment, President Trump's first term, he ended the COVID-19 pandemic. There is no mistake. Make no mistake. Whoever wins this election, will be dealing with the COVID epidemic in January. As of Tuesday, more than 226,000 people in the U.S. have died from COVID-19. The seven-day average of new cases is nearly 70,000, a record number that is only expected to get worse. Hospitalizations and deaths are also climbing steadily upward. According to the COVID tracking project, there are more than 42,000 people hospitalized with COVID-19, up from 30,000 just a month ago. 
And speaking of science, science? No, thank you. The Trump administration, we just learned, has recently uh, removed the chief scientist at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They removed the agency's acting chief, scientist Greg McLean, and they replaced him with a hack, with a libertarian Cato Institute, quote, scientist who is on record as being a major well-known critic of climate science and climate scientists for what he calls unnecessarily dire predictions. A former White House policy advisor was also appointed to know as chief of staff. He continues to replace scientists with hacks. It's so dangerous and so awful that it's the most motivating thing in a way, I think, for me. Because, it's, I mean, I mean, his racism is so outrageous that you can't get past that and the sexism, as I always say. But as soon, if I were to, and I don't, I move right on to the issue of his denial of science, which is obviously related to why we have this epidemic, because he's not listening to the experts. He's listening to a radiologist on COVID-19, a radiologist that he saw on Fox News. That's who he's listening to. Meanwhile, in Biden-Harris world, former President Barack Obama was in Orlando, Florida, where he was addressing another parking lot filled with cars and honking, enthusiastic honking horns. Where he took aim at the current president and really, I think, in a hilarious but important way, tore him up. Here's a quick soundbite. And what? What's his closing argument? That people are too focused on COVID. He said this at one of his rallies. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. If he had been focused on COVID from the beginning, cases wouldn't be reaching new record highs across the country this week. If we were focused on COVID now, the White House wouldn't be having its second outbreak in a month. The White House. Let me say this. I lived in the White House for a while. You know, it's a controlled environment. You can take some preventive measures in the White House to avoid getting sick. Except this guy can't seem to do it. He's turned the White House into a hot zone. Oh, my God. Some of the places... He holds rallies, have seen new spikes right after he leaves town. And over the weekend, his chief of staff said, and I'm quoting here, I'm not making this up. His chief of staff on a news program says, we're not going to control the pandemic. Yep. He just said this. Yes, he did. And yes, we noticed you're not going to control the pandemic. Listen, winter is coming. They're waving the white flag of surrender. Florida, we can't afford four more years of this. That's why we've got to send Joe Biden to the White House. All right, President Obama stumping for Biden-Harris ticket in Orlando, Florida, where Joe Biden has a slight edge there. By the way, thank you to everybody who listened to and gave me feedback on the Pam Keith interview and is or donating to her campaign PamKeithFL.com. That's the second interview I've had with Pam that aired on yesterday's podcast, where the interview with uh, Roy Wood Jr. was also very well received. Anyway, let's go back to Orlando, where President Obama, former President Obama, continued ripping and criticizing Donald Trump. Our current president, he whines that 60 minutes is too tough. You think he's going to stand up to dictators? (laughs) <laughs> he thinks Leslie Stahl's a bully. <laughs> just yesterday, just yesterday, he said that Putin of Russia, Xi of China, and Kim Jong-un of North Korea want him to win. <laughs> we know. <laughs> we know because you've been giving him whatever you want. Exactly. For the last four years, of course they want you to win. <laughs> That's not a good thing. (laughs) You shouldn't brag about the fact that some of our greatest adversaries think they'd be better off with you in office. Of course they do. (laughs) What does that say about you? Uh, I mean, think about that. Why are you bragging about that? Come on. 
And that doesn't make any sense. Joe Biden wouldn't coddle dictators. He'll promote human rights around the world, including in Cuba. Joe will restore our battered standing around the world because he knows our true strength comes from setting an example that the world wants to follow. A nation that stands with democracy, not dictators. A nation that can inspire and mobilize others to overcome threats like climate change and terrorism and poverty and disease. And here's one other thing. Joe and Kamala, when they are in office, they're not going to have... You're not going to have to think about them every single day. You're not going to have to worry about what crazy things they're going to say, what they're going to tweet. They're just going to be too busy doing the work. All right, there he is. Former President Obama campaigning for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and really savaging the current president and his absolute stupidity and coddling the worst leaders in the world because he wants to be just like them when he grows up. All right, I also wanted to play you this from MSNBC that really went viral yesterday. Nicole Wallace is the anchor. She is a former Republican strategist who worked on the McCain-Palin campaign, but she has gotten a tremendous amount of respect and credit as she has become a political pundit, anchor, I guess you could call her journalist. She works at NBC, MSNBC. I don't know what you would call her. I, I, I think she's uh, basically like an opinion columnist every day. But she does interview a lot of different experts from across a wide range. You probably know and either like her and MSNBC or you don't. Either way, yesterday she had former senator from Missouri, Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill on. And the two of them savaged award-winning columnist uh, Peggy Noonan, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, who went after Kamala Harris for the way that she was dancing in the rain the other day. You may or may not have seen that. But Peggy Noonan wrote in the Wall Street Journal, for her part, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris is went on the trail giddy. She's dancing with drum lines and beginning rallies with, what's up, Florida? She's throwing her head back and laughing a loud laugh, especially when nobody said anything funny. I, I think that's kind of funny. Uh, she goes on, Peggy Noonan, and writes, she's the younger candidate going for the younger vote, and she's going for a happy warrior vibe, but she's coming across as insubstantial, frivolous, and when she started to dance in the rain on stage in Jacksonville, Florida, to Mary J. Blige's work that, it was embarrassing. Well, that, that did not go over well at all with a lot of different folks in the world of politics and political punditry. And so here is Nicole Wallace and former Senator Claire McCaskill reacting to Peggy Noonan's column. And they definitely don't hold back. A lot of people are talking about this, and I wanted to play it for you here on the podcast. Here's the other piece, and I don't know if um, uh, right-wing Twitter can handle this. I'll give them a second to get their tweeting fingers ready. Okay, here it goes. When you're a white woman and you're a Republican, there's just certain stuff culturally that you don't know jack bleep about. And you should keep your mouth Ooh. shut when other people dance. I mean, what is that line in there about dancing to a drum beat? This, to me, felt tone deaf. It felt nasty. It felt personal. And it felt bitchy. Oh, snap. Okay, so I'm going to take a deep Deep breath, and I'm going to try to stay calm here. <laughs> Please, about about Peggy Noonan, what I admired in my life. She said at the end of that, you didn't read the very last part of that paragraph, Nicole, because she said it's embarrassing. No, Peggy, I'll tell you what's embarrassing. Yeah, I didn't read it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell her what's embarrassing right now. Listen up, Peggy. Here's what's embarrassing: a president that pays off porn stars. A president that pulls babies out of the arms of their mothers. A president who says he likes to grab women by the you know what. A president who uses the White House for campaign events. A president who praises white supremacists. And yes, even a president who can't dance, doesn't know how to show joy or empathy, and, and tries to do some kind of ridiculous arm thrust to YMCA. That is what is embarrassing. Kamala Harris is anything but embarrassing. She is uplifting. She is inspirational. She is strong and substantial, and she's going to be one hell of a vice president. Wow. Thank you. 
I have I never better. loved you more. <laughs> I've never loved you more, Claire McCaskill. Thank you so much. Perfectly put. Wow, there you go. And now you can see why that went uh, so viral yesterday. What else do I have for you in the grab bag of audio on Stand Up with Pete Dominic? I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, here's this. I saw this making the rounds on the Twitter. Sasha Barrett Cohen, uh, here's a soundbite from his keynote address at the Anti-Defamation League's 2019 Never Is Now Summit on Anti-Semitism and Hate. And I thought it was super relevant and it's probably why it's making its rounds again here on Twitter. Of course, this is the guy who plays Borat in the new Borat film. Have you seen it? Here it is. Uh, just a soundbite remarks from Sasha Barrett Cohen, who is the recipient of the Anti-Defamation League International Leadership Award. Today, around the world, demagogues appeal to our worst instincts. Conspiracy theories once confined to the fringe are going mainstream. It's as if the age of reason, the era of evidential argument, is ending. And now knowledge is increasingly delegitimized and scientific consensus is dismissed. Democracy, which depends on shared truths, is in retreat. And autocracy, which depends on shared lies, is on the march. Hate crimes are surging, as are murderous attacks on religious and ethnic minorities. Fake news outperforms real news because studies show that lies spread faster than truth. On the internet, everything can appear equally legitimate. The rantings of a lunatic seem as credible as the findings of a Nobel Prize winner. Voltaire was right when he said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. In the end, it all comes down to what kind of world we want. If we prioritize truth over lies, tolerance over prejudice, empathy over indifference, and experts over ignoramuses, (laughs) then maybe, just maybe, we can save democracy, we can still have a place for free speech and free expression, the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Today, these rights are threatened by hate, conspiracies and lies. So allow me to leave you with a suggestion for a different aim for society. The ultimate aim of society should be to make sure that people are not targeted, not harassed and not murdered because of who they are, where they come from, who they love or how they pray. All right. How about it? Sasha Baron Cohen, the star of Borat and so many other films. I actually really like that miniseries he did about the uh, Israeli spy. What was that called? Oh, it was called The Spy on Netflix. (laughs) Really enjoyed. Based on the life of Israeli's top Mossad spy, Eli Cohen. Yeah, that was very good. He's a great actor and comedian. And uh, the new Borat is amazing. I watched it Friday night. Have you seen it? If you haven't. I highly recommend it. It's real, real good and uh, shocking. Shocking! That's the one where Rudy Giuliani had his hand down his pants with a young girl in a hotel room, and apparently we're not talking about that anymore. All right, so before I get to my great guest, Professor Eric Siegel, talk about Amy Coney Barrett and what her confirmation on the Supreme Court means and the analysis of the upcoming election and how the Supreme Court might, or probably it won't, in my opinion, play a role I just wanted to say that Friday night I'll be hosting a Zoom hangout at 8 Eastern. 8 Eastern this Friday night. I'd love to hang out with you. That's October 30th, 8 East. you got to be a subscriber, a member of the stand-up community, which you could do right now for as little as $5. And then you will get the link at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. And then you should have the information to join us. I'll try to invite some of my special guest friends to hang out, stop by as well. And maybe we can just distract each other, get to know each other a little bit to beat back uh, everything that we're all thinking about and dealing with, with this election right around the corner. All right. So that's Friday night, eight Eastern subscribe. Now, if you haven't already, we'd love to welcome you into the community. If you haven't joined one of these types of online communities, I think that are popping up, then you're, you're invited to ours. A lot of cool people from all walks of life, from every background. So check us out. All right. 
Here it is, my conversation with Professor Eric Siegel, who I've known for years because he was a listener to the show, called into the show, became a guest on the show, became a personal friend and confidant of mine, a mentor of mine, has been helpful with me and my marriage has been helpful with me, with my parenting, you name it. This guy has seen all my skeletons and ghosts since we've known each other because I have uh, I held him in, in real high regard, and he is a constitutional law scholar at Georgia State University. He's the author of two very important books, most recently Originalism as Faith, but his book Supreme Myths is excellent. He's very active on social media, specifically on Twitter, at E. Spin Siegel, and now he has his own podcast, which I'll link to in the show notes, and you can find by just looking up uh, Eric Siegel, Georgia State University. Here it is right now. All right. So, of course, I had to reach out to Eric Siegel to talk with him about the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett. And I I think just, Eric, I want to start. Thank you for joining me, as always. Uh, I want to just jump right into kind of the emotional impact of Ruth Bader Ginsburg dying in mid-September, right before an election where the most the least popular president of all time was most likely not going to be reelected. The fact that she dies in mid-September and then he appoints Amy Coney Barrett. We talk all about it in the run up to it. And, and last night she was confirmed. It just it's very hard emotionally, I feel like, to understand that all of this happened in just over a month. How are you, how are you looking at it from a kind of a personal emotional standpoint? I'm depressed. Um, I've been a critic of the Supreme Court for 30 years. The, I, I mean, Bush versus Gore was a low moment. Shelby County versus hold of the voting rights case was a low moment. Um, you and I actually kind of met on Citizens United. That was the second time I was on your show. That was kind of a low moment. Um, or one of the first times I was on your show, but the image, I couldn't even watch it because I would, I would have, uh, honestly, it, it would have given me physical pain. The image of Justice Clarence Thomas, a partisan Republican hack who was unqualified to be in the Supreme Court when he was nominated, a person of extraordinarily low character, a person who lied during his confirmation hearing about never having debated Roe versus Wade, a person who didn't report his wife's taxes for many, many years because they were involved in lobbying stuff like against Obamacare, a, a person who has at, who, who in person is very fun and cut and warm, but has no integrity at all. He replaced Justice Thurgood Marshall, one of America's greatest heroes, not a great justice, but of course, the person who argued Brown versus Board of Education, the person who devised the strategy for Brown versus Board of Education. So Thomas replaced Marshall, uh, one uh, great liberal African-American, American hero replaced by an African-American. I don't know, you awful, don't, terrible person. I don't right. have the words to say. Right. Um, and then we have Clarence Thomas. Yeah, well, last the, night. Marshall was a hero for African American progress and rights, and Clarence Thomas was or is not. He's an obstacle. He's a major obstacle right. to African American rights. Right. Um, and uh, then, and then Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg again, as a justice, she didn't do very much because she couldn't, because the court was owned by Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor for almost her entire career. Um, but an American hero as well, for the same reasons as Justice Thomas. I'm sorry, Justice Marshall, um, before she became a justice, she changed the world for the better for women. So you have Marshall and Ginsburg who changed the world, not just America, the world for better for African-Americans and blacks, African-Americans and women, excuse me, being replaced by Justice Thomas, who is an obstacle to African-American rights. And just this 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 woman, Amy Coney Barrett. Um, who is going to be a major obstacle to civil rights in this country for possibly 45 years. That is almost too much to bear. And uh, the the notion that we trade these progressive Supreme Court justices for these repressive Supreme Court justices um, is, is very sad. Now, I say that because I'm a progressive. Uh, you know, I'm an equal opportunity critic. Justice Ginsburg voted for the Democratic Party as consistently as Justice Thomas voted for the Republican Party. The difference is she was a hero before she got in the Supreme Court. Justice Marshall voted as liberal and as democratic as Alito does for Republicans and for conservatives, but he was a hero before he got there. I also, and, I, and this is just my prejudice. Alito my was a hero threat. before he got there? 
No, no, no. I mean, no, he votes as consistently Republican as Sotomayor, let's say, votes consistently Democrat. Neither of them were heroes before they got there. Ginsburg and Marshall are different, Pete. They're different. They're not they're 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 they're, you you could wipe away their Supreme Court careers and they'd be in every American history book or they should be. Maybe not in Texas, but in most places they'd be in in the history books because of the cases that they Uh, argued and won in front of the Supreme Court. Well, more than that, though. Yes. But as lawyers. Yes. Yes. More than that. Now, this is my bias. So now I'm so now my bias is going to come out. Both Marshall and Ginsburg um, strike me. And I know a lot of people who knew Ginsburg very well. And I know some people who knew Marshall pretty well. Um, Pete, they were people of integrity. Justice Thomas is not full stop. And we'll see about uh, not because it's politics. Like, I think I think justice. Let's take um, Roberts. Um, I think he's issued some of the most horrific decisions. I have no reason to think he, he doesn't have integrity in his personal life. Like I, I wouldn't call him, you know, uh, I, I don't I, 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 I disagree with him on things, but I have no reason to question his integrity. Justice Thomas is not a person of integrity. Um, Justice Marshall was. Um, I don't think Judge Barrett, Justice Barrett, is going to prove to be a person of integrity. I really don't. Um, I think she is. She represents like one half of one percent of the American people. And her religious extremism. Are your daughters on or do they use TikTok? (laughs) Okay, I don't know where that comes from. I'll tell you um, where. You'll you'll, you'll see where I'm going. uh, Well, my answer is my my younger one, youngest, Katie, was on it. However, some misconduct required us to remove her from it. Uh, My older daughter, Sarah, who's 13 next week. uh, Yeah, she's on it and she uses it. And so, yes, that's the answer. So and Katie, we back, we back on it soon. I can't speak. <laughs> she returned <laughs> soon and her handle is I, I, I this is purely anecdotal, but I'm sure a lot of other parents listening, if they're paying close attention, would agree that they're getting their news from TikTok. Really? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of their news and information and even opinions because. And and I could go into it in, in more depth, and maybe I will in a segment with some expert on adolescence and, and social media at some point. But but here, but I today Ava, almost sixteen, who you know well, uh, came in yeah. the kitchen and said, "Dad, uh, I saw on TikTok that, or actually, I think she said her friend told her that if." That Amy Coney Barrett, this new Supreme Court justice, is going to to make abortion against the law. And the consequence, if you get abortion, will be the death penalty. <laughs> is that going to happen? No. And um, I said to her, wait, no, sorry, I said <laughs> for you. Yes. But not for other <laughs> girls. No, I was just like <laughs> I was I, my point of bringing this up to you was that that's what like the most extreme kind of thing that young women are currently hearing. I mean, that's you, you hear about these dystopian futures or even America's past and, and abortions and alleyways and all these things. Yeah. And, and so the concerns that people have, especially young people or people who aren't paying as much attention, ignorant are, I think you're here to uh, belie those a little bit and tell us, you know, kind of what you expect to come of Amy Coney Barrett's time on the court? Well, let's go broader for a minute, Pete. Okay. Um, so let's take the two of, there are three, I think, I guess there are three major social cultural issues facing America, maybe four. Let's say abortion, gun control reform rights, however you want to phrase that. Um, I think LBGTQ rights and affirmative action, affirmative action being a distance fourth. But those are the four, I think, biggest like, kind of cultural, legal, social issues we have. Yeah. Just, so so uh, gender, race, sexual orientation and, and gun violence. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about abortion and let's talk about abortion and same sex LBGTQ rights for a minute. This next segment right. is brought to you by Let's Talk About Abortion <laughs> with Professor Eric Siegel. As um a- my reading, which I've done a lot of, and my non-empirical, completely non-empirical, but anecdotal experiences with my daughters and my 28-year-old, 29-year-old daughter, is that, and this makes me happy and then sad, as far as, and you're going to agree with the first part, as far as LGBTQ rights go, you know, at, at most people under 25, even under 30, it's not an issue for them. They don't even think about it. Like my 12-year-old, my 11 and 12-year-old, it, it, they, they can't even conceive of a world 
where gays and lesbians are treated differently than anybody else. They're just people. Like, yeah, I think they're, they're I think they're perceived in a way almost as cool. Like it's yes. almost yes. cool to be yes. to be yes. gay or bisexual. Yes. De- definitely cool. That, yes, my, my, in some my, places, my, yeah. I'm not. Uh, you know, be very... okay. So it's not true in rural Montana, but it's true in most places. It is true in most places. Mm-hmm. I think polls show that. I do. Um, now, I think the Supreme Court will be a lagging. The Supreme Court is going to let religious discrimination trump LGBTQ rights. But I think that's the only area where that's going to happen. And we just saw that. We saw it last term where Gorsuch and Roberts joined an opinion that held that Title VII and employment discrimination laws apply to LB, LGBTQ people. The polls show that like 65 percent of people think that gays and lesbians should have equal rights at work and so on. So I, 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 I think there'll be some conflicts between religious discrimination and LGBTQ rights. But my point is the younger generation, it's not an issue for them, Pete. It's not. And, and, and it's going to go away in 25 years. We know this. But the same is not true for abortion. It's not. And I, and I think there are a lot of kids who are 20 and 25 and, and maybe even 18 who are conflicted. And, 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 you know, you know, that, that issue has been with us since the seventies, as opposed to LGBTQ rights, which has been with us, you know, 10 years and their parents, their conservative Midwest parents or their conservative Atlanta, you go to Atlanta suburbs, which are very Republican and, and the kids don't care about LGBTQ. I mean, they, they, they think they're just people, but you ask them about abortion mm-hmm. and it's very different. So that makes me very nervous for women. Um, and that doesn't, you don't choice. see that like that being it's interesting, the issue of, of abortion, which you've talked and learned and know so much about. You've worked with Planned Parenthood yeah. for so many years. Yeah. And it, I think about it. Obviously, we think about it a lot. It, it, it pisses me off so much, Eric. Me too. <laughs> like I just I just hate that anybody like we have gotten there has been a cultural shift where even. A lot of my friends that are are so working in the abortion rights movement, women's reproductive rights movement, like, um, uh, well, several people basically think that there's nothing wrong with it, even like I is nothing wrong. Now, the cultural shift is I'm pro abortion. We used to argue, well, no one's pro abortion. Well, some people will say that now. I mean, that's that's on one side, but it just pisses me off that people use the argument as if it's a reasonable argument. That we believe in late term abortions when we're only talking about abortions that would that the, the, the baby is severely ill or that the, the health of the, the mother is die. like that's right. Why but, is that right. such a hard thing for people to understand? No, because, because because of a because of a well-funded. Uh, what's 19? I'm not good at math. How long ago is 1980? Uh, 40 years. A well-funded 40 year misinformation campaign about abortion with incredible moneyed interests. Um, and, and, and it's also an anti-Supreme court thing. So you combine both of those things. Here's my thing about abortion, Pete, that really simplifies it. I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, cause you know, I've written, I've written three pieces on how to talk about abortion. I did, I did, I did on your show. Well, I'm you glad did. I brought it up then. I don't, yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd be a great we person. Did, we did. You might not remember, but you and I did. I, I forget everything. Uh, uh, you, we, uh, we, we did an entire show on how to talk about abortion. I'm sure we did. I, I, I'm sure I because, learned something from it. Uh, because what I was trying to say in those pieces was both sides have to have empathy for the other side before we can even start. And the pro-choice side has to, you know, stop, you know, saying they want to destroy women and the pro and the, and the pro-life side needs to maybe pick a different phrase for that. Anyway, here's my point, though. We can disagree about everything, but there's one thing we can't disagree about. Abortions will always happen. Right. Next. So now the only question is, how do we want abortion? That's a fact. Like they've happened in every civilization, in every society. Even where, of time. even where the consequence is death, if it's you have death. abortion. Even where the consequence is death. So, the, and, in Amer- and in our country, in 2020 or 25 or 30 or whatever year, we're in a much more... Um, women are, you know, outside the home, you know, need to control their reproductive destinies to have the life they want than, than almost any open society since the beginning of time. But there's, and so my point there is even in closed repressive societies, there are abortions. In our society, there's always going to be abortions. And so now the question becomes, okay, if you're anti-choice or pro-life, what do you want to do about that? You tell me what happens after Georgia prohibits abortions. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Women, rich women will go to private doctors and get safe abortions. 
uh, middle class and upper class women may be able to do that or, or may not, but they'll buy black market pills and black market stuff. And poor women will most likely have unsafe abortions. Is that the world you want? Are you really pro-life? Beth, because you can't stop abortions. You can't stop abortions. There Why is, is no, that so hard? There's no scenario in which abortion would be made illegal in every state in the country, right? The only no, scenario is yeah. that it would be made illegal in... Well, well, no, hold on. No, no, not true. Not true. Um, so there are people on the right who want Congress to get into this game and pass a law, a national pro- prohibition on abortion. Uh, in fact, your friend and mine, uh, the, the, the idiot from Kentucky, Rand Paul and I, had, Rand, <laughs> I actually had a debate with Rand Paul about this. Um, there's a guy named Mike Sachs who used to be used to be on HuffPost Live. Remember HuffPost Live? He texted me and the other Mike, night. And, I know Mike well. I love him. He, Mike's a great guy. Mike had me on with Rand Paul and a couple of other people. And when it came my turn to ask him questions, I said, Senator Paul, you are the sponsor of a law out of Congress that says life begins with fertilization. You want to dictate that view to all 50 states, and you claim you're a libertarian. Explain that to me. He walked off. He, <laughs> he did not walk off. He did. He did. He did. He, 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 the segment ended, basically, effectively, five minutes later. Yeah. My um, argument with him was about climate change and his whole, he denied it, and I was like, you're a fucking yeah. doctor. That was right. what I think I said to him. But, but is he? Yes, he's an ophthalmologist. He does surgery. It's on eyes. An ophthalmologist. Okay, right, right. Okay. He does. He right, performs yeah. surgery. Like he's. Okay. It's, it's. Okay, so we're off track. Let's go back. All right, let's go back abortions, to abortions. Abortions are going to happen. If someone says no, Eric, they're not. Then I'm going to say, how are you going to stop them? Because making it illegal won't stop them. Never has. Never will. You're going to do that penalty. Yes, I'm going back to your initial point. Now, here's what I think. I think that Roberts. And Kavanaugh and maybe Gorsuch would say that a state law that say gave a 10 year prison sentence to a doctor who performed abortions. I mean, abortions, you know, now now row row in case you're gone. Georgia prohibits all abortions except for rape and incest. Um, And now a doctor is caught performing abortions and gets 10 years in prison. I don't think they would approve that sentence. Uh, Thomas would and, and Alito would. I think Judge Barrett would approve a 50 year sentence. I think she's going to my point. My point about Judge Barrett on all of these issues, whatever they are, gay rights, um, abortion, affirmative action and especially gun rights. She's going to be with Thomas or to his right. And that's really scary because we know who she is. She is a in her personal life, a extreme religious zealot. I mean, even Thomas isn't an extreme religious zealot. She is. That's what she is, Pete. She, she's, she's, we right. know this. I mean, she, she was on the board of directors of private schools in 2015 whose official policy was homosexual conduct is sin and, a, and an abomination to God. So she's the worst. She's going to be the worst. Now, sometimes people change. When you get unreviewable power, And a job for life, Justice Blackman changed. Justice White was a Democrat, became very conservative. Justice Souter changed a little bit, uh, and so on. Who's the last religious zealot that you saw change? I mean, it's rare. It's yeah. it happens, yeah, but it it's happens. rare. And I and then they they usually go and they usually they usually go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, or, they, they flip flop all the way. Yeah, the yeah. Well, they get caught in the act of yes. having sex with a yes. guy or something. You know, yes. like I'm thinking exactly. about Ted Haggard. Uh, exactly. And, and oh, there, many, there were there are there are many examples. The Fal- Falwells yeah. most recently got into it. Oh, yeah. oh, well, well, all of those guys are, are having sex in, in outhouses with people. I mean, no <laughs> outhouses. Well, that's because um, there's a very famous case. But uh, Larry Flint, publisher of Hustler magazine, yeah, did a cartoon of Jerry Fal- something about or said Jerry Falwell was having sex in like in an outhouse with his mother or something like that, and and Fal and and Falwell sued, and the Supreme Court said correctly, no reasonable person would view that cartoon as serious. You know, it was parody, so you can't sue for anything, which was the right decision. Uh, that's why I, that's why I mentioned that um, Larry Flint did the country a huge service in that case, by the way. 
And you, I mean, by making that principle, that, that parody and satire is not actionable. Let me ask you about uh, now we, we've been focused on abortion as it relates to Amy Coney Barrett. Let me just they'll move on and, and ask you about a, not 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 predicting the future on how she might uh, decide on certain uh, issues. Well, just one, which is yeah. if the election were were close and it went to the yeah. courts, do you see any scenario where it would even get into the Supreme Court's hands so Greg Sargent of the Washington Post. Yeah, he's a great, great guy. Yep. And uh, yep. And uh, <laughs> both he and Rick Hasen and Rick Hasen has forgotten more about election law than I'll ever know. That's his specialty. Like I would say I've forgotten more about originalism than he would know. He knows more about election law. Than I'll ever know. Um, they both wrote op eds today uh, saying don't because Kavanaugh's opinion last night cited Bush versus Gore. And it was the first time a Supreme Court justice has ever cited Bush versus Gore in a substantive That was way. A, just real quick. That was a decision that came out last night about Wisconsin's yeah. Yeah. voting rights, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, but the, but but I think they don't agree with me. So maybe they but I, I think the most important part of that is Kavanaugh signing on to a very Bush versus Gore. The fact that he picked that moment, he must know. Kavanaugh knows. First of all, Kavanaugh was a lawyer. For, let's just start there. Kavanaugh, Roberts and Barrett were all lawyers for George Bush in 2000. Think about that for a minute. All three of them were in Florida helping George Bush. Now they're on the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah, what does that mean, though? That's yeah. just one of those kind of... Well, it means Republicans stack the court with Republicans, which Democrats would do too, but I'm just pointing out where we are. Um, so this is what could happen. I was just having this conversation with Greg, because both he and Rick wrote these op-eds today, and, and, and Rick's was a little bit mixed. He said, don't panic today. You might want to panic tomorrow. Um, this is what could happen very easily in a, in a few swing states. There could be debates over whether ballots should be counted or not. Well, for whatever reason, late ballots, um, badly marked ballots, whatever, whatever the dispute is, there could be a dispute. And what the, what, Cav, what, what the, what the, what the Fox news justices made clear last night in this Wisconsin case, Roberts made this crystal clear. They all made it crystal clear is that at the state level, a state Supreme Court is not allowed to make more votes count or be counted if the legislature disagrees. In other words, it is up to state legislatures, not state Supreme Courts, and that's really bad for Democrats because there are a bunch of swing states that have Republican legislatures, but Democrat Supreme Courts like Pennsylvania, for example. Um, so, so now let me finish. So if a dispute like that in a swing state is what the election is riding or, or several swing states is what the, or, or several states is what the election is riding on. There are only two scenarios I think that could happen. Well, there are three. One is that the Supreme court could rule in a way that helps Democrats, but that's not going to happen. I mean, it could, but it's not. The second scenario is Barrett recuses and it's five, three. Republicans. That could happen. Or Barrett doesn't recuse and Roberts or Gorsuch, probably Roberts, sides with the liberals, though not really sincerely. And now it's 5-4 with one Republican defecting. So it's not a totally partisan vote. What's not going to happen, what is not going to happen is a 6-3 vote for Republicans to settle the election. They're not going to do that. They'll, they, they won't. There's just no. I, I mean, I I would be shocked if John Roberts. Everything John Roberts has showed us in 2012, 2016, and 2020 is he is really nervous about the Supreme Court, you know, being in the thick of election year stuff. That's why he ruled the way he did on abortion, Pete. It really is. That's why he. That's why he joined with the liberals in the abortion case. Because if he hadn't, and they had struck down those ridiculous Louisiana laws we talked about, then that would have put the Supreme Court front and center in the election. He didn't want that. So I, I think he's concerned about the court's legitimacy. He showed that in 2012 with the Affordable Care Act case four months before the election. But having said that, he's still a Republican. Pete, what you have to understand is above mm -hmm. all else. Well, above all else, Judge Barrett is a is a far right religious extremist, but the rest of them are Republican. That's my point about Bush versus Gore and Roberts, Barrett and Kavanaugh. 
Kavanaugh's entire professional career is as a Republican. See, that's the difference also between Kavanaugh and, let's say, Ginsburg. Yes, Ginsburg was liberal and Ginsburg was progressive, but she did not serve for Democratic institution, Democratic right, Party. Right. You know, um, Breyer did. So we have to admit that Justice Breyer worked in, for the Senate. And, uh, you know, um, but but Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and Roberts and Alito and Thomas, they are Republicans all the way down. Right. Don't forget. Well, it. Now, 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 having said that. Roberts, I don't think, is a Trump Republican. Right. But but the other five are. So. He has this interesting history on voting rights cases. Roberts. So, yeah. So so his but I well, just but last I don't see he, it, by the way, I don't see it. Just to be clear, like everybody, the polls are predicting a massive win for Joe Biden. And I don't. Happen. Well, regardless if you think it's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, well, not regardless. I mean, if you don't, if you think it's not going to happen, then it's more likely that uh, some kind of issue would be right. at some point brought to the courts all the way up to the Supreme right. Court, similar to what happened in 2000 with Gore v. Right. Bush. But I mean, I, I just don't, I just don't see. It. I mean, I, why do you not think it's going? What do you think the outcome of the election is going to to be based on what you're reading? I'll take your political analysis quickly. <laughs> my non-expert, polit- my totally non-expert political analysis, my my citizen analysis is that. The country is too divided, there's too much cheating, and there's too much interference for there to be a landslide um, in the Electoral College. I do think there will be a landslide in the popular vote. In fact, my fear, my, if you ask me my, my biggest fear is actually not Trump getting – my biggest fear for our country is Biden wins the popular vote by 9 million or 10 million and loses the Electoral College by three votes or something. Because I oh, think we'll yeah. take to the streets. When, don't you think that's going to be uh, that would be yeah rise? that would that would be a thing yeah. where where the American people would just overwhelmingly feel like their voice had not yeah, been heard I, because I, of this broken I, electoral I, college I, system and then yeah, I I I think that would be like rushing the White House type thing. I mean I, I think do. he's going to win Texas, Eric. There's, okay, I spent dinner on that. Sure. Okay. Okay, we're betting dinner. When I lose, I'll give you two to one odds. You buy you buy me one dinner, I buy you two. When, See, that's either bet. way, when we're out to, after <laughs> I've lost and you're collecting your bet, at some point there'll be a pathetic moment in during the dinner. You'll be like, you know what? You don't have to pay for this. That'll happen. That's true. I know you. And that'll <laughs> that's happen. You're like, don't even worry about this, by the way. And then I'll order he's more not food. Not going to win Texas. I wish people would stop saying he's going to win Texas. He's not winning Texas. Beto O'Rourke said it's his to lose. <laughs> Texas is Biden's to lose. Says he's Beto. Not winning. Trump is not losing Texas, and he's not losing Georgia either. <laughs> well, you're um, you're too inside of Georgia to really have a <laughs> an accurate opinion. I mean, um, I I I am very so. Last in 2016, you laughed me off. You won't remember this either, or you'll deny it. But about a week before the election, maybe five or six days, you had me on, and I said, um, I think Hillary is going to win. I think it's going to be much closer than people think, but it would not surprise me in the least if Trump wins. And you almost you, – you literally left me off your show. Hmm. I'm – and you have, to, you have to concede that you never thought he was going to win, never for a second, because you didn't. I have all the five tapes. I, I, I do I do concede that, yeah. and I, and okay. I still think – well, I, I didn't. Yes, I didn't know there was going. There was so much cheating, cheating. going on and suppression. Right. I mean, but there's more. There's more this time. There, there's much more suppression this time. There. So, how do you see that? Um, Where we've had years since 2016 of Republicans figuring out way to make voting more difficult. Now I know what people are going to say. The early voting numbers are way up and the absentees are way up and all that stuff. And I hope that's right. And I hope I'm wrong. Um, so, Pete, let's take my state, for example. Now, now, now I want to be very clear. This is Eric Siegel talking, not Professor Eric Siegel talking. OK. Well, now Got I'm it. confused who I'm talking to. He's talking to just Eric Siegel. Can you just Billy come Joel. up with a different name? Yeah. That's a pseudonym of some sort. As you e. Give e. Us Siegel. This... e. Siegel. E. Siegel. That's um, not really that fun. Our governor was the secretary of state. The secretary of state in Georgia controls voting. He controls that still as governor. That That's it's the job it, of it, every uh, every state's secretary yeah. of state, right? That's the one of the main and, and, responsibilities. And in the states, a lot of them are Republican. And they're going to cheat. 
Yeah, how? How, how do you? How do you? Man, you throw up. Well, the same way, the same way JFK got elected. You know, Mayor Daley got rid of ballots, stuffed ballots, did all kinds of things. JFK doesn't get. I, I, I just recently saw something that calls this into question. But I had always read, heard, and I read books that suggest that JFK does not win unless Mayor Daley does all kinds of shenanigans in Chicago yeah. to get him Illinois. Yeah. Now, there, I think there's been some pushback on that narrative. But certainly that's been an overwhelming narrative for 30 years, 40 years. Um, I, I think that the more polarized a country is, the more likely it is that, the, uh, by the way, I, I'm, I, I suspect Democrats will cheat too. The stakes are, I'm sure they will. The stakes are so high. That I, I and 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 that's where we get into the electoral college, which is so freaking stupid. Um, I, but when I, you I, see cheating, what you're thinking about is all different kinds of a potpourri of ballot uh, confiscation, where you just took this box of likely Democrats and it just never made its way in, or th- those types of, and and you think it's organized or Pete Pete Pete, let, Pete. in. Uh, wherever my, my in, in that very liberal county in, in Florida, at the very bottom, I forget what it's called. We, uh, it's got Broward County, whatever county it is. Um, it ended up that in a very, very Jewish district, like all Jews, you know, because Miami, you know, transplanted New Yorkers, they overwhelmingly voted for Pat Buchanan. Pat Buchanan was overtly anti-Semitic, overtly anti-Semitic in 2000. Um and uh, every and 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 Jews knew that I mean, public knowledge. He was he, he made it overtly. I've MSN heard this this claim. It's true. And it's true. about the 2000 election, and and yeah. and I'm not saying it's not true. But what did the, what was done to change the vote from the Democratic candidate to this Republican anti semite? Uh, well, we never we, we never found out because they weren't. Oh, really? We don't know. Them. Yeah, it seems. Um, like- I, I voted the other day, and I went and. Um, the Republic, Republicans were on top of the ballot on every line and Democrats way, way down. That makes a difference. Uh, that's the Georgia, and, the state of Georgia's yeah, ballot. Yeah. The, yes. the order of yes. the candidates yes. makes a yes. difference. Yes. Um, so there's and, jockeying and, for that. Yes. I never and heard of Democrat that. State, I'm assuming in states that are controlled by Democrats, it's the other way around. I don't know. I assume that's true. Um, you, you think it just be alphabetical order or something. But can you explain to me why Donald Trump would be on top of Joe Biden? If Biden I don't know why Trump? that matters. Does somebody? How does oh, that affect someone's voting? Like I'm voting for the for the first person I read. Is no, that, they're, they're, Pete, Pete, Pete. I must be missing something. I don't. You are. I don't know how many. By the way, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of PTSD from your wor- use of the word potpourri. That's the first time you've ever used that word in our conversation. Did, like, did, it, did it seem? It, it seemed malapportioned. Not, not like, <laughs> it seems what's wrong with me what's happening with me right now some Opry. some soul with a slightly larger vocabulary you know, is taking over my here, here's what's going on you you live with three women i live with three women and they use words like potpourri men don't use words like <laughs> a variety a selection <laughs> of i don't know Miss, a diverse so set. get um, past please, your please. shock I don't, over my total, I don't know i don't know how many total votes are cast in america but what's 60 million 80 million whatever it is do you have any idea how many of those votes are random or people who don't know what they're doing, don't know who they're voting for and just go in and check boxes? I don't. I have no. Well, it's a com- tremendous amount. Why do you think so, that? Be- I feel like people that are motivated enough to go get up their asses and vote know at least a little bit about I'm not even going to have this conversation with you. Why not? Why aren't you going to? Cause, cause you- we- because it's going to make me sound really bad. About how stupid people are. Oh, well, that, that, I think. Listen, back. no, I think people are really, really <laughs> stupid. I think a lot of Americans are are very dumb, okay. increasingly dumb. But if you are a voter, you're, you, <laughs> you at least know who you want to vote for. By the way, Spe- you now called more, the American people. You called the American people dumb. Not yes, I do believe that because there's the a, a religious domination of this country that, that <laughs> lends itself to. There is. If, if uh, that's how I. You don't think that that's true? Tangent I'm number not. seven. <laughs> Americans I'm a law are, professor. You're, you're, you're. <laughs> there are millions and millions of, of, of brilliant, amazing, awesome human beings. Many of them subscribe and support this show. I'm not talking about the people who pay for this show, obviously, <laughs> or anybody they care about. I'm saying that in a country that believes increasingly that JFK Jr. is going to come back. What is that? That's religion. There's a huge, on the Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap. 
we can stop with this country voted Trump in stops. We don't need any more evidence or proof of our yeah. I should have said that. Well, you got me work, you got me worked up and needing Sorry. to defend it, um, and I thought that was a given. Uh, anyway, let's go back to our original conversation because I, I will. So I want to be honest. Rick, uh, I'll say it again. I said it 20 minutes ago. Rick Hasen, I think, is the leading election law scholar in the United States. Number one. I think Greg Sargent is a thoughtful. I mean, they're both liberal. I mean, they're both Democrats. So both you're parties. saying read both their finish. pieces. Let me, let me finish. Let me finish. They both wrote op eds today saying, you know, it's it's good to be on alert and it's, you know, we have to worry, but they don't don't panic. You know, especially Greg. Greg's piece was very much. It's very and he interviewed Steve Vladek, who's been on your show. He interviewed Rick. And they're like, yeah, you know, it, it's it's unlikely to happen. Well, I'm the guy. Sorry. Now I'm going to now I'm going to do what I haven't done yet publicly. I'm the fucking guy who said in 2012 that we need term limits, that we need cameras, that we need to weaken this Supreme Court because it's been broken for 150 years. And everybody laughed at me. Everybody. I didn't laugh at you. It's why I made you a star because of the book Supreme Myths. You did. I generally believe. But I think (laughs) those types of predictions are different (laughs) because your legal (laughs) analysis is original and I think very progressive and often right. But the political analysis is what you are doing here. And what Fair you enough. are doing here is you're saying my record on legal analysis is really good. And we're talking about the the outcome of this election, which. No, I'm just I'm saying. So so I think I think which what those guys saying, don't think I, it's going to get to the Supreme Court because I, of the polls. They well, they, they think it's not going to get the Supreme Court for a complex set of reasons, one of which is. The polls. Others is that what what scenario brings it to the court. Um, my point is, if there's a twenty percent chance of it getting to the Supreme Court or a fifteen percent chance, you and I both know if there's a ninety nine percent chance they're going to throw it to the Republicans, right? That's I, I don't know that. Oh come on! You can imagine New York Times headline: Supreme Court hands election to Biden. <laughs> That's I, the I, test. I, I, the I, test I, is always: Can you close your eyes and imagine the New York Times headline? Supreme Court hands election to Biden. I just, I, 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 I have no, I shouldn't even <laughs> say anything because my, my analysis of it is just, just <laughs> completely tainted by my inability to imagine such a thing. That, that mean the court handing it to yeah, Trump. It, because of everything you've um, taught me about the justices not right, being judges, politicians right, in robes, right. I look at them and say, yeah, even though you're Kavanaugh, you're Gorsuch, you're Amy Coney Barrett, even though he appointed me and I hate Democrats, I do realize that this guy is 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 destruction embodied every day and we cannot continue another day with him. And so I don't care about anything but getting rid of him. Like, it's hard for yeah. me to believe that they well, what, what if, wouldn't well, what if see it but, that but, way. But what if you're Justice Roberts? And you're how old is he? I don't know how old. Sixty something. And but he's been he's been on the court since two thousand six. That's he's been on the court already fourteen years. And he expects to serve fifteen more years, whatever. And he's he's a little tired. I mean, if you were Justice Roberts, wouldn't you be tired? Like I'd be tired. And he also knows, as does Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Barrett, and Scalia, and and I mean, and Thomas and Alito. God, what a what a lineup. Uh, <laughs> they know. They know that if Biden wins, court reform is around the corner. If Trump wins, court reform is gone. Four more years. Not an issue. It's off the radar. Interesting point. If you don't think that's there's many factors going on. Okay, so let's move on to that. That's a really interesting point. And let's wrap up by talking about court reform. What is it and what do you expect to happen? My political analysis of this is I can just see this being the only issue that dominates media dominates politics this supreme court the future of the court how many justices you're never gonna how then we're gonna talk about statehood for puerto rico and dc getting rid of the filibuster i mean what a what a crazy two years that would be to get any of those three done so i just so so on my podcast my personal podcast today i had caroline frederickson on who is the former um head of the american constitution society and what did she say i'm going to tell you because uh, she's politician. I mean, that's not a politician, but she's, you know, she ran a She ran a public interest organization for 10 years. Uh, she's a very smart lawyer, a very smart person. And um, <laughs> it was very interesting to me, actually. Her, her her perspective, first of all, had shifted. She didn't totally admit this, but it has shifted dramatically to 
I want a progressive Supreme Court to I want a very weak Supreme Court. You know, a lot of liberals have moved in that direction. I was saying that, you know, in 2012. But in any event, what, if Biden were to win <laughs> and the Democrats were to get the Senate, what she said, um, and she knows much more, about this, much more about this than I do, she said Democrats have to do it fast and hard and 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 right away and, and forget the bipartisanship. Do not consult the Republicans. Ram it through because that's what they will do. They will never change. And now that's her perspective. And she's much more tuned than I am. My perspective, as you might expect, is very different. And I've been saying this, Pete, everywhere I can and writing it and doing everything I can. No one's going to listen to me. But <laughs> the, the, the message has to be. Someone asked me, you know, Biden says he's going to create a commission of con law scholars to study this on Twitter today. Someone said to me, you think you've been on the commission? Because you in 2016, I wrote about court reform hmm. for eight months. That's all I wrote about. Remember, you wouldn't let me talk about it on your show. Eight is great four Republicans, four Democrats for the rest of time. The Senate can do this, just like do a filibuster. And you wouldn't even let me talk about it on your show. It's the only right. time you've ever said That's right. You've said to me twice. That's one time. The second time we won't talk about um, What? What's the second time? Well, you censored me about Monica, about what's her name? Sarah Palin. You oh, that's because you, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah okay. that's... But in any event, my message is going to be <laughs> not court packing and not court reform, but court balancing and court weakening. And what we have to convince the what Democrats who have to convince the Republicans of is it's in your long term interest, not not your interest in five years or 10 years, but over over 50. It's in the country's fucking interest to not be ruled by elite life tenured lawyers. Right. It's in our country's right. interest. Right. Well, the, so yeah. so agree. So, so we have the power now and God, are we going to use it unless you come to the table and we can agree on a set of reforms and life tenure and life tenure. Supreme Court, end it, um, balance it, six Republicans, six Democrats, um, and and have an ethics code for these monsters so they're actually bound by something, um, put them on TV whether they want to or not, condition their budget on them being on TV, um, and that's in everybody's interest, and then we go home. I like Eric Siegel's Supreme Court reform. I like it. I just, I'm, I'm, maybe I wasn't listening well enough, but the, what is the discrepancy between you and what Caroline Fredrickson says about this? Because what you're saying, what she's saying is ram it through, do it quick. I hear that from a lot of people. I don't like the sexual yep. undertones when anybody uses it. But what I hear you saying is call it this. And I agree with it, by the way. I've been using it. I've been telling other people to use it. Call it weakening the course. Don't pack the course. Yes. Make the course weaker. I That's what you've yes. been saying. I, I've stolen that and spread it. I think it's great. But that doesn't uh, the, the, that doesn't contradict what she was saying. She's talking about the speed of which it should be done, how it should be done politically. Well, well, and you're no, saying no, I, I agree. I, how I, it should no, be no, talked I, about. I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that was contradicting what she was saying. Uh, okay. I was saying okay. so, an, an, expert, an expert in the area had this idea. But Pete, you have to understand, there are other people than Caroline and I who want to make sure they build a structure where the court has liberals and Democrats dominating, as opposed to a structure where neither liberals nor conservatives can dominate, which is what I want. Right, right. That's what I want. Okay. Well, that's that a great sense. place to end because uh, we're yeah. not doing predictions so much. <laughs> we're not doing analysis so much. We're talking about you know, different scenarios that could occur. And you, I think you clear up a lot and you give a lot of people Thanks. a lot of different ways one last opinion? to think about it. Of course. Yeah, sure. I think I want to go on record on this. I thought a lot about it. I haven't said it publicly. Uh, I, kind of said I don't it publicly. think if it's what I think you're about to do, I think it's a bad idea. What do you think I'm going to do? I think you're going to accuse me of having a guest house. No, <laughs> No, but I but I like that idea. All right. No, so I thought no. you were doing a bit here. This is going to be something serious I, and heavy no, now. This is serious. Oh. Not heavy. Yeah, a little bit. Mm. No, I can do it next time if you want. Want to keep? Want to wait? Want to wait for it? Well, do you want to tease it? Um, I've already. Is it depressing? It. Yes. Oh, then let's not do it. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Okay. Yeah, I don't. No, nobody okay. needs that. Let's hope. Let's hope the next time I talk to you. Which will be hopefully next Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. What are you doing um, election night? Uh, watching the returns of my family. Right, so if you want to stop by or hang, we're going to be hanging. Oh, you will. I'll yeah, do that. it'd be oh, awesome sure. if you popped oh, in. My whole family, my whole family. Of course, Sharon Katie would love that. Yeah, yes. we'll do that. Are they sure. paying members? <laughs> their 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 father is. Then no, <laughs> they have to sign up. They have, I have to, to tell Sarah and Katie that they think their allowance money and 
Yes. Pay you? Yes. Okay. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. I'll let you, I'll let you tell them. <laughs> Hopefully the next time we talk business in this, in this mode, yeah. Joe Biden will be the president elect. By the way. Okay. I do want to say one last thing. <laughs> Even if Biden wins by a landslide, I mean, he runs the table or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. We know next Wednesday morning, Trump is going to be gone January 20th. Thank goodness. My friend, Sandy Levinson, who's a law professor at the University of Texas oh, and Sandy. also teaches at Harvard and Yale, um, 20 years ago, uh, something like that, a long time ago, wrote a book that basically said our Constitution is really stupid and we have to change it. He called it Constitutional Stupidities, I think. And um, he went through a bunch of like electoral college and the Senate. But one of his biggest, 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 biggest stupidities, which could come to bite us right now, was the, 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 the time between November or whatever it is next week and January 20th. And he predicted that a the time between fact, election night and yeah. election day and inauguration yeah. day, or as yeah, I call he, it, he, the taint. A, a, a corrupt administration could do all kinds of damage during that time. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing America can do. With Here's that. what I I have a thought about that. It's actually yeah, go. it's moderately yeah. intelligent. <laughs> it is. I think it is. I'm sure it's highly intelligent. Uh, yeah, no, but usually, you know, I don't say anything that's really mine. That's <laughs> thoughtful. I, I've also often read it or heard it. And so I think it's Joe Biden gets elected. And he says, OK, now just want to be really clear. And I want to be really fair with everybody that is currently in the administration working in high important levels. We're watching you. And we will prosecute you if you do anything illegal. Well, I have a story about that. And Excellent. so this is a warning. We I don't want to do anything. We don't want we have enough work. Do you think uh, that threat's gonna stop Trump? If not Trump, but That's how right. much damage can Bar? Tr- there's a difference <laughs> y- yes, the people that will have to carry out Trump's insane uh proclamations right. during that time. Right. They, they're they're going to be like, you listen, I'm, I'm not going, dude, I'm not. It surprises me, though, that a lot of people have died on Trump Mountain. But somebody's got to be like, dude, I'm not doing this for you. Yeah, I hope you're right. You may be right about that. That was highly intelligent. But but I don't know. But the point is, <laughs> Joe whether, Biden whether, saying that we will prosecute you if you during right this period wrong, commit crimes, whether you're right or wrong. We have to change this. This is really stupid to have this. T- well, how would it, well, what's a better way to do it? What do other got, countries do? Got, first of all, it's in the constitution. So we got to do an amendment. You know, had, make it, make it December 15th, whatever. Who cares? Um, Pete, when I was at the department of justice, um, in 1988, I'm sorry, can we, is this too long? Can I no, I love our talk. Dude, I love it. I'm just, okay. the only problem okay. is I've been staring at a the, chicken sandwich for 40 minutes. This is a, I'll finish with this story. It's actually a very good story, although it's hearsay, but it's confirmed. Then I'll take a so bite. I, I'm going to take a bite. So I'll tell you when I'm ready. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. I, I report to George Bush's, the first ones, uh, Department of Justice um, in, Janu- in, in 1988. And, and I inherited a bunch of cases, including a large class action suit by federal employees represented by the NTEU, which is the National Treasury Employees Union. Mm-hmm. And, and they were suing the government for a whole bunch of things. It was being – they're represented by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law, which is a really, really good organization. You see – um, and this class action had been going on for like 12 years. Like it had been just been just up and down in the court. Anyway, when I inherited the case, I, I learned from several of the lawyers who had been working on the case that this is really true. In 1980, uh, Carter loses to Reagan in November. And there's a court hearing in this very case that I'm working on still in 1988. There's a court hearing in front of a judge in D.C. about class actions, and, and they had actually agreed to settle to some degree to settle the case, the uh-huh. Carter administration and his people. Carter's lawyers, Carter's Justice Department, in, in November of 2000 and uh, November 19, sorry, November of 1980, Carter's lawyers go to this court hearing in then November to present their settlement agreement. And Reagan's the Reagan's lawyer showed up. The, the people he was going to have in the Department of Justice starting in January showed up at this court hearing and said, we don't like this settlement and we don't want you, judge, to authorize the settlement. And we're going to be you know, the law in, in, in six weeks. And the judge turned to them and said, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one government of the United States. It is still the government of the Carter administration. Yeah. And you may and you may leave my courtroom. That's and, inter- she that, that, and, that, and she and she and she kicked him out of the courtroom. That's a, a fascinating story, but it's also does not seem controversial to me. 
It shouldn't be. But my point is, my, but Pete, my point was Carter was entering it, it never. And then Reagan, in fact, the Reagan lawyers then did undercut the settlement agreement. And that's where I had the case hmm. eight years later. Um, my point is. There's only one government of the United States until January 20th. And even Jimmy Carter lawyers were trying to get things kind of in before the new administration came in because they knew it would undercut what they were trying to do. Now, imagine that power in the hands of Donald Trump. That's all I'm telling you. That's all I'm saying. Well, we could have ended on a higher note Sorry. earlier. Okay. 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 Here's a good note. Okay. I am really looking forward to Lynn and Katie and Sarah and myself. If it wasn't COVID, it'd be Jesse, but she can't come over because of COVID. Um, uh, the four of us joining you guys on election night for some part of it. Awesome. And, and just, and just, well, it's awesome that we're watching this with our daughters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. That's, that's, I should, me, that's I, you know, really... I didn't even think of getting my daughters involved, but I should make sure that they are watching it with me. That's a good point. Well, I so. think it's, it's a historic day and they'll remember it the rest of their lives. It's hard for me to, they don't, they don't um, it's hard for me to get them engaged in some, some of the things. Although Julia stayed up and watched the entire debate herself. Uh, the first, the first presidential yeah. or no, the uh, vice VP debate she watched. And I'm right. glad that she did. Cause right. it was yeah. a woman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there you go. All right, Bob. All right, my friend. Thank Maybe you. Vi- everything? No, okay. so I could good. talk about Billy Joel. I could talk about nope. the Knicks. I'm no, good. No, okay. I'm good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, my Thank friend. Thank you very much, pal. <laughs> Bye. Love him. Love Eric Siegel. And so do so many of you. Follow him on Twitter at Eastbin Siegel. Check out his podcast. Get his books. And he's going to check in with us on election night. We are doing an election night hangout. I hope to see you there as well as. Friday night at 8 Eastern, you get the link by becoming a subscriber. So become a subscriber and join us in the stand-up community, which is growing each and every day. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to welcome you to the community. Everybody has something to offer, something to gain. I hope to see you there. Okay, that's it. I love you. You're not alone. Check us out on Discord, where there's always folks mulling around, happy to chit-chat. Keep connected. Keep your company when times get tough, lonely, and uh, and scary. So check that out. We'll talk to you tomorrow.